Whenever I think of those four French cardinals, I'm inclined to say for one cardinal said to Pacelli, who was then past the twelfth when uh, Hitler came to Rome, and um, oh, Ribbentrop came to Rome, sorry, and uh, Pacelli wouldn't see him, but this Magliani uh, saw him, Maglione saw him, and he came into Pacelli up and he said, well, I have prayed to God that he would open his eyes. And, um, uh, and Pacelli said, well, please, God, God will close them. <laughs> so <laughs> I often think about the four <laughs> French cardinals. They're so left-wing, they're so feckless, mm -hmm. and I know they're cardinals of my church, and you know how um, uh, a rabid a Catholic I am for authority. The, it was the Pope of 1960 who was supposed to reveal the secret and do and follow out the instructions, do what it said. The Pope of 1960 was the good Pope John, the 23rd. He refused to do that. He refused to obey Our Lady. He refused the mandate of heaven. He refused to publish the secret, and he refused to do what it said. Mm. And uh, consequently, consequently, uh, we're in trouble. Perhaps one of the most controversial figures in traditional Catholic circles is the late Malachi Martin. Noted author, former Jesuit, secularized priest, and frequent guests of radio hosts like Bernard Jansen and Art Bell, Martin was a figure that was on the one hand very benign, and simultaneously, on the other hand, very unsettling. This video, longer than any I've made to date that isn't a reading of a long encyclical, will focus on getting to the truth about Malachi Martin. Why is there a need for this? Because the clergy abuse crisis of McCarrick and the allegations made by Archbishop Vigano, combined with the non-response to the crisis by the Pope, has led many to reading some of Martin's controversial books, including one where he explicitly claims that the Catholic Church was infiltrated by Satanists who held a special black mass that enthroned Lucifer in the Vatican during the Second Vatican Council. Like I said, Malachi Martin was a controversial figure. The need for a video like this is due also to the outright hostility to him. In traditional Catholic circles, there are really only two reactions to Martin. First, either absolute love of his work, typically with him being treated as a hero. The other reaction is the opposite, condemnation, based on allegations made against him from various quarters. This video is the result of research into Malachi Martin, with the aim of speaking the truth. But to get to who he really is and the truth about Malachi Martin, first we must know who he was, what his story was, and how he found himself in the position to make some claims that some have said are crazy about the church and the world. This video is only the first part of two videos, with the second tentatively titled The State of the Catholic Church According to Malachi Martin which will come out in the new year, once I finished reading the most critical works of his on that subject. Malachi Brendan Martin was born in Ballylongford, County Kerry, Ireland, to a middle-class family. The family had a strong Irish identity, which they defended by having the kids speak Irish in the home. Unlike their countrymen today, Catholic belief and practice were central resulting in his three brothers, including Francis Xavier Martin, also becoming priests, and two of them becoming academics. Martin received his secondary education at Belvedere College in Dublin. He studied philosophy for three years at University College, Dublin, and on September 6, 1939, became a novice with the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. Yes, Malachi Martin was a Jesuit. He taught for three years, spent another four years at Milton Park, Dublin, and was ordained in August 1954. He received doctorates from the universities of Louvain, Oxford, and from Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where he concentrated on knowledge of Jesus as understood by Islamic and Judaic scholars. He was an expert in ancient languages and had done early scholarship on the Dead Sea Scrolls, which marked him as useful in questions of ling linguistics, which will become important later when he was allegedly exposed to the third secret of Fatima. His time in Jerusalem is important here. In 1996, he published an article in the New York Times describing Jerusalem. 
He writes glowingly of the city in the way only a historian, archaeologist, and biblical scholar can. This quote is illustrative. Dawn over Jerusalem is incredibly beautiful. It starts with a radiant whiteness and then a kaleidoscope of colors. Ten measures of beauty descended upon the world at creation, the Talmud says. Jerusalem received nine of them. Jerusalem's heat is dry, its air freshened by gentle breezes. The light of its sun softened and mellowed by reflection off the Judean limestone from which most of its buildings are made. Within these walls, you soon discover there lie four distinct quarters, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Armenian. It will take you at most two hours to walk through them cursorily. Martin studied in Jerusalem, and like many Christians who have made pilgrimages to the Holy Land, he fell in love with Jerusalem. We can see this happen with figures in the church today, like Steve Ray, a convert to the faith who gives tours frequently of the city and of the Holy Land, with a historical biblical emphasis. That very same article I quoted from does reveal that, unlike many Christians who make the pilgrimage, Martin avoided the temptation of universalism. That might be a startling claim made by those who know him best from his Art Bell interviews. But these words strike, strike me as unequivocal when describing Jerusalem. Jesus was born near here, off to the south, in Bethlehem, the village of David. Within these walls, he was tried and condemned. Within these walls runs the Via Dolorosa, the path he followed to his execution. There is also the site of the temple, where as a child he listened to the Jewish scholars and was found by his anxious mother. And there, as a man, he taught, prayed, disputed, drove out the money changers, forgave sins, and cured the sick. One of the accusations against Martin is, that is easy to dismiss is the claim that he was a Mossad agent. People do actually make this claim, which is strange, but it is based off of something I will address later in this video. In addition to the time he spent in Jerusalem and Israel broadly, he had a role in the Second Vatican Council, working as a Jesuit to change the teaching of the Church regarding the Jews. The final document, Nostra Aetate, upheld traditional teachings of the Church on the Jews, though in practice it was ignored wholesale by virtually everyone in the hierarchy. I'll go more into this claim against Martin later. Suffice to say for now, the accusation that he was a Mossad agent has no bearing in reality. Martin was ordained a Catholic priest in the Society of Jesus in 1954, prior to receiving his three doctorates. Yes, three. As someone who is finishing a doctorate, the idea of pursuing three seems insane to me. But then again, I don't consider myself to be in the same mental league as Malachi Martin. Until 1964, Father Martin worked as the secretary of Cardinal Bea in Rome, where he participated in the Second Vatican Council. He became disillusioned with the direction of the Jesuit order and requested to be secularized. This is an important point. Many Catholics today dismiss Father Martin's claims because they think he was laicized, but he wasn't. He was secularized. Let's take a brief side trip to define the differences. Laicization is the practice of a priest leaving the priesthood, functionally speaking. This can be done voluntarily or as a punishment. Remember, Holy Orders is a character-changing sacrament, and once it has been validly received, it is never invalidated for any reason. However, when a priest is laicized, they are freed from the clerical state and dispensed from the promise of celibacy by the proper authority, which can range from the local ordinary, that is, the bishop or abbot, up to the Holy Father. He can no longer function as a cleric, meaning celebrate the Mass or hear confessions, among other duties, but he remains a cleric forever. This process literally means to be returned to the state of the laity, according to the Code of Canon Law, paragraphs 290 to 293. He still bears the sacramental character of holy orders. He can perform the sacraments validly, but not licitly, because in so performing them, he would be in violation of church law and would be culpable for the infraction, since he no longer has the faculties to perform as a priest. Faculties meaning permissions, an authority granted by the bishop. The Code of Canon Law makes one exception for emergency circumstances. Quoting the Code, Even though he lacks the faculty to hear confession, any priest validly and licitly absolves from any kind of censures and sins any penitent who is in danger of death, even if a proved priest is present. 
paragraph 976. Here the church recognizing that once you are ordained a priest, you are so ordained forever. Thus, those laicized priests in jail, now and forever, are priests. Period. Secularization is different. I'm going to quote an article from newadvent.org for the definition, and that's a source I don't normally use, but they are a this is a good definition of secularization. Secularization, an authorization given to religious with solemn vows, by extension to those with simple vows to live for a time or permanently in the world, seculum, i.e., outside the cloister and their order, while maintaining the essence of religious profession. It is a measure of kindness towards a religious and is therefore to be distinguished from the expulsion of religious with solemn vows and the dismissal of religious with simple vows, which are penal measures towards guilty subjects. On the other hand, as secularization does not annul the religious character, it is distinct from absolute dispensation from vows. This is likewise a lenient measure, but it annuls the vows and their obligation, and the one dispensed is no longer over religious. As a general rule, dispensation is the measure taken in the case of religious with simple vows, while secularization is employed where there are solemn vows. Nevertheless, there are exceptions in both cases. Sometimes lay religious with solemn vows or lay sisters are wholly dispensed from their vows, religious life in the world being very difficult for lay persons. In other instances, religious men or women with simple vows are authorized at least for a time to lay aside their habit and live outside their houses, at the same time observing their vows. Such is the case, for instance, with religious men and women in France who have temporary renewable secularization in virtue of the instruction of the SC of bishops and regulars, which is a document from the 24th of March, 1903. It is not therefore correct to speak of religious dispensed from their vows as secularized. The, the expression applies only to religious with solemn vows, especially to religious priests. Secularization is granted to these regulars, like dispensation to religious with simple vows, either for reasons of general order or for motives of personal and private order. To the first class belong expulsions and suppression of religious houses by various governments. For instance, Spain in 1839, Italy in 1866, France in 1902. To the second class belong various reasons of health, family, etc. Secularization may be summarized under two heads, maintenance of the religious life and at the same time relaxation of the religious life so far as is necessary to, in order to live in the world. I will let Father Martin describe his secularization. Yes, my own background is this, that I was born 76 years ago in a remote corner of Kerry Island uh, on, the, on, the, on the Atlantic in a stone house. And um, I was educated in Dublin, and then I entered the Jesuit order. I became a Jesuit in 1939 on the eve of the war, and I was a Jesuit until 1964. And in the meantime, I did special studies. I was trained as an expert in Semitic languages, Oriental art, and uh, archaeology and in um, anthropology and theology, uh, and getting doctorates out of all that sort of thing. And uh, I ended up as an expert, uh, uh, first of all, uh, on, on Middle East questions, and uh, gradually I was co-opted into helping uh, a pope called John the 23rd, the Roly Poly Pope, <laughs> uh, Angelo Roncalli, as he was called, mm -hmm. and then his successor, Paul VI, uh, who died in 1978, to be succeeded by John Paul II, uh, with an interim pope of 34 days old, John Paul I. I um, but in the year 1963, 64, I went to Paul VI, whom I knew very well, and asked him for permission to leave the Jesuits, uh, to keep my vow of celibacy, but to forsake my vow of poverty so I could earn my own living, and uh, uh, also forsake my vow of obedience so that I wouldn't have to obey people whose policies I did not like and whose theology I suspected of uh, not being uh, orthodox enough for my mind anyway, whatever, because one must finally rely on one's own judgment, because you'll, only be ju you'll be judged only on your own judgment, not on what anybody else says. And I came to New York in that year, 1965, and I've been here ever since for my sins and my happiness. <laughs> I became an American citizen 
the ritual time five years later. As you can see, he was released to vows of poverty and obedience. The first, poverty, as he said, was so he could earn a living, which he did as a cab driver in New York before winning a Guggenheim Award that enabled him to write a book full time. That's not the first profession I would have chosen because that is a, an extraordinarily difficult job, especially in New York. The second is interesting. Why obedience? Simple. Martin was incredibly critical of the Second Vatican Council and the innovations that emerged from the Council. I recommend listening to his interview conversations with Bernard Jansen. They're fantastic and illuminating, to say the least. With a vow, without a vow of obedience, he was free to speak as he chose about the issues facing the church. Much more importantly, he was free to write about them as well, free of official ecclesial sanction, short of excommunication. This will be important when we turn our focus to his writings and the controversies that they spawned. But on the topic of secularization, Father Martin continued to say Mass privately, daily, and publicly when the local ordinary permitted. He heard confessions in churches when needed and, most famously, assisted in New England as an exorcist, a subject of which he wrote in his infamous book, Hostage to the Devil, which has been credited with inducing nightmares in people. Those duties would not have been continued until his death unless he retained the canonical capacity to do so. In the end, Father Martin would write an astonishing 16 books, most famously his work Windswept House, which has become important in the light of the crisis in the church. He was writing a 17th book, which will be important towards the end of this video. For now, I will leave you with this. Malachi Martin died on the 27th of July, 1999, of a hemorrhagic stroke that was the consequence of falling down a flight of stairs from his wheelchair. There are controversies around his death, including the disappearance of the manuscript for his final book and things he is reported to have said to the paramedics who arrived but failed to save his life. But that will wait until the end of the video. Malachi Martin wrote 16 books in total, as well as numerous essays, articles, and letters, many of which have been interpreted by lay readers in a very liberal manner free from context. In some cases, as a scholar who studied Judaism and Mohammedism, he has been accused in some quarters as having been a Kabbalistic set of a contest, which is a new one to me, but the internet is dark and full of terrors. One thing is for certain when reading his writings. Father Martin had first a love for Pope John Paul II, and then he became disillusioned with his Slavic Pope, as he refers to him in Windswept House, due to that Pope's inability to cleanse the hierarchy of the heretics and the apostates that are in positions of power at the moment. His central claim about John Paul II was this, that John Paul II was all but a prisoner of the Vatican, that he had to get the signatures of several cardinals in order to appoint bishops and to create cardinals. This is worth remembering as we hear accusations against John Paul II regarding the sex abuse crisis given that it has been established that he likely knew about McCarrick's dealings in crimes. Is it outside the possibility that John Paul II was unable to act because he would need the signatures of several men who were likely McCarrick's allies in order to act? According to Martin, not only was John Paul II essentially a prisoner in the Vatican, his only recourse was to become a globetrotting pope, who aimed to bring Christ to the people directly, and to become a sign of hope in a world sprinting towards disaster. And what was that disaster? What has openly been called the New World Order, but what most of us these days call globalism, which has become the naked push to erase national borders, reject national sovereignty, to erect a global secular system of government. And Martin claims that the elements within the church restraining his Slavic Pope were actively working to turn the church into the partner of the globalists by having the church focus on secular issues like immigration, wealth redistribution, and concerns about the environment. Reading those claims in the 1980s and 1990s when Martin was writing probably would have seemed far-fetched to most Catholics, save for those who were foot soldiers for preserving and restoring, tra restoring tradition. But in hindsight, it's absolutely on the mark. Martin would mask his crit critiques of the church in what he called faction, 
Faction is an otherwise forgotten genre of writing that produces what some call the nonfiction novel. If that sounds confusing, let me explain with an example. His work, Vatican, which details the sequence of events leading from the establishment of the Vatican Bank at the end of the Second World War through the papacy of John Paul II, focusing mostly on the turbulent years of the Second Vatican Council and its immediate aftermath. This is a novelization of events that presents in painstaking detail the facts of the Council, the development of the new Mass, with the main players' names masked with pseudonyms, including Pope John XXIII, referred to as Papa Angelica, or Archbishop Bugnini, the, ar the architect of the Norvus Odo Missae, under the moniker Archbishop Sugnini, which isn't remotely subtle. He did this for a few reasons, including so that he could maintain plausible deniability when he made some startling claims, which he does in three works of fiction. As an aside, I'll be writing a review of Vatican to be followed by reviews of his other works of fiction to be available to my patrons on Patreon and Subscribestar when those works are finished. But the point of faction as a writing method is simply to tell the story in a way that is engaging, but also educates. We frequently see a character in each of his works that is obviously Martin himself interjected into the story as a main but secondary character, as the events of the story are the main character itself. In Vatican, it's the young American priest whose career is followed from 1945 until the novel's end sometime in the late 1980s, a character which often spent months at a time behind the Iron Curtain, establishing lines of intelligence gathering in underground church building, which is work Martin himself engaged in for the Jesuits prior to his leaving their order. It certainly is an interesting way of writing about history. To be clear, however, he has gotten a number of facts incorrect, including the birth date of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, an error Martin made in his book about the Jesuits, a nonfiction work exposing the Jesuits for the promoters of liberation theology that they are today. I doubt he'd be surprised that the likes of Pastor Jimmy Martin have become the face of the Society of Jesus either as, uh, shall we say, rainbow liberation, is only a step removed from the Marxist-inspired liberation theology. This book certainly earned him enemies, including the head of the Jesuit order, who then spent the rest of Martin's life attempting to suppress his writings and smear the priest, until after his death he admitted that Martin had been discharged with priestly faculties intact, in essence backing up Martin's own claims about his being a valid priest. This, uh, this relationship with the head of the Jesuits is something to remember when we address some of the things that Father Martin was accused of later, as the most salacious claims against him have direct connections to not only Jesuits in general, but to actual known heterodox uh, teachers in the order. But religious political fiction is not the only thing that Martin spent a great deal of time writing. He also wrote what I would call speculative nonfiction, as evidenced in his book, The Keys of This Blood, which was a detailed work describing what Martin saw as Pope John Paul's mission in the world as he fought against the New World Order. Prophetically, Martin would claim in the 90s that, amidst the collapse of the Soviet Union, that Russia was still a major threat internationally, and that the Soviets hadn't really surrendered, but merely retreated. A claim that seems prophetic today, given that Vladimir Putin was a KGB agent, and that those ha who had been, and still are, in, in important positions of power in modern Russia were all former Communist Party members of relative importance. I'll let uh, Father Martin explain his theories about Russia himself. You know, there is a common persuasion, it's an illusion, that there was a revolution in those five countries of Eastern Europe. East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Poland. And the people simply shucked off, threw off the chains of the Soviet Union. The fact is, there was no revolution. The people did not rise. There was no revolution. What happened was that each of the strong men in charge of those countries for Moscow, a man called Erich Honecker in Germany, uh, a man called uh, Zivkov uh, down in Bulgaria, a man called Milos Jackis in Czechoslovakia, and so on, they got a telephone call from Moscow saying, get out, let the people in. The thing was consented to and arranged from Moscow itself. There was no revolution. Then the people took to the streets in joy at being uh, 
liberated from the, the Russian presence, as it were. That's the first thing we must remember about the, the breakaway of the, the so-called revolution uh, in Eastern European countries. There was no revolution. Moscow decided to get rid, to skip its representatives, these horrible men it had in charge of these countries. They ground down the faces of the people with armor, military armor, and prisons and secret police. Number one. Number two, in Russia itself, we've been hearing for the last two or three years that Mikhail Gorbachev is on the plank, that he's finished, that he's going, that his plans are broken, that it's a short, in a short time he will have disappeared. This man was never so powerful as he is today. Never so powerful. And the arm of his power, the two arms of his power, are still intact. One is the thing which the Russians call the Komitet Kosovo-Sarnienoi Biazapazanosti, otherwise known as the KGB, or the KJB, as the Russians refer to it, KJB. And it's the secret police. It's more than a secret police. Uh, we speak about secret police as the arm of government. The KJB, or the KGB, is the government, and is the government which Mr. Gorbachev now presides over, of the reformed Soviet Union. It's a different setup from what our media tell us and from what popular commentators have given us as the view of facts. It's a different situation. The two arms he has, therefore, are the KGB and, secondly, the huge missile ray of the Soviet Union. Now, Mr. Gorbachev has made it impossible for us to say no uh, because he has gone to the West. He had two stages in his plans. First of all, the stage was to come and be seen. He actually wore trousers with a crease in it. And he had a wife, Raisa, beside him, dressed in a very, very uh, fashionable way. And she charmed the West as a very cultured lady. And she is indeed. She lectures at Moscow University. She's very versatile. And she's multilingual. And she's a convinced Marxist, as indeed Mr. Gorbachev was and still is. The first thing was to make himself known, become the glad boy of the West. And he did. You remember, if you read the papers and seen, saw the television, it was Gorby, 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 whether he was pressing flesh in chance for San Francisco, or Washington, or Chicago, or Detroit, or Paris, or London, or Rome. Uh, his popularity soared. He was considered to be the man who opened up the Soviet Union. And the picture he presented of the Soviet Union was that, well, you fellows in the West, you originally thought that we were just a big, ugly, stinking bear with claws, ready to kill you. Well, now we're just a little cuddly teddy bear who needs his diapers changed and he's hungry, so help us. This was the message given in the first stage. The second stage was more difficult for him because it meant that he had to make himself accepted as a member of the West, as an inherent member of the market, the Western market system of America and Europe, which had achieved such economic prowess in the 40 years during which the Soviet Union went down economically, but up militarily. He did this in a very simple way. He knew there was a coup coming, the famous coup, in last August, 19. He was told it was coming, the Chinese said it was coming, we said it was coming, the CIA said it was coming, his own men said it was coming, two of his chief men, Shevardnadze and Yakolev, resigned saying there was going to be a coup within a week. There was. There was. Now, there's a common illusion about the famous coup in Moscow of August 1991 that Mr. Gorbachev sort of said to Raisa, Raisa, let's get away from it all. Let's take the kids and go down and get some sun in the Crimea. And, you know, and uh, it's so childish, you know, because it's just like as if, as if President Bush could say to uh, Barbara, Bobby, let's get out of here. Let's go up to Kenny Bunkport. Get away from it all. and Let's have some sun with the kids and some fishing. Everywhere Mr. Bush goes, he is, as every president is, goes surrounded by the presidential bubble. His instruments of war, his suitcase, the famous suitcase, and his secret service connections and protection, and his uh, control of the executive branch of government. He never can take a vacation and go off sun his tummy with Barbara on the, on the seashore by himself. It doesn't exist. Likewise with Mr. Gorbachev as president of the old powerful Russia, Soviet Union. He could not go away, dive off and hole up in a bungalow on the Crimea, on the Black Sea shore, and pretend to forget it all. He went with the presidential bubble, too. He knew there was a coup coming. He knew every step of it. 
And uh, the funny thing was that we in the West looked at it all through a camera perched on a ledge overlooking the streets of Moscow. So the coup was a very funny thing. And by the way, it only took place in Moscow. We were only looking at the Muscovites milling around, and only some of the Muscovites, the major portion of the people in Moscow, were trying to uh, queue up for food and earn their living every day. Only a couple of thousand, maximum 75,000 participated in the famous coup. It was a marvelous, as the French say, coup de théâtre, an act of theater, which led us all to believe that finally the Soviet Union was breaking up. Certainly, Martin wouldn't be surprised in the slightest about Russia's aggression against the Ukraine or Putin's talk of having developed weapons capable of destroying the United States in mere minutes, or even the partisan political accusations being made. In his writings, there is a weave of geopolitical concern woven into the faith seamlessly. For while Catholics shouldn't be obsessed with secular politics, we cannot ignore them either, for politics has always been a weapon used against Christians since the birth of the faith. Christ's first material enemy was Herod, a king, who used the power of the state to attempt to have him murdered, as you'll recall. But even geopolitics and faith weren't his only topics that he wrote extensively on. At the most basic level, Martin understood that his audience were probably largely not Catholic, and that he had a duty, as a Catholic priest, to educate his audience about the nature of reality. That reality is both material and spiritual, and that the spiritual mattered greatly. We see this on display most notably in his interviews on NPR for his work on his work called The New Castle, a largely forgotten work of his that detailed what he thought at the time would be the great struggle facing man as we collectively approached a turning point in history everyone could sense was coming. This awakening, which on the surface sounds pagan, was a concept that he'd continued to develop over the course of his career. It's most on display in his work, The Keys of This Blood, again, a sort of attempt at understanding jo the John Paul II papacy as a force of Catholics and those who held traditional ca Abrahamic faiths versus the agents of the emerging New World Order, or again, what we could tend to call globalists today. While what I said about his not being completely focused on geopolitics now sounds contradicted, Understand that in his mind this was ultimately a battle between good and evil writ large, and that the global elites have their role to play in the end game of civilization. This great awakening is most fascinating because there is now a sense that we are at a pivot point in history of the West, and perhaps the world itself. Martin thought that this would result in a sign from God where all peoples would understand where they stood with God before the coming material chastisement. Disturbing? Perhaps. Martin often made reference to the alleged apparition at Garamandal, which has never been uh, a church approved. He was convinced that after this event happened, John Paul II would emerge as the religious and spiritual leader of all God-seeking people of goodwill in the coming conflict with the global elites. Now, given that John Paul II died in 2005, this has obviously not come to pass. And the type of pope that is alluded to in Windswept House and the Final Conclave may now be seated on the throne of Peter. It looks like Martin's ability to guess the future wasn't exactly spot on. He never claimed to be a prophet, which is important to remember. Again, here's Father Martin himself on that awakening. Father, um, I have a very specific question for you. I suppose it's going to end up sounding like a book plug, but I, I've, I've, I've written a book that's going to be coming out Monday. You can... Oh, lovely. Tell uh, me the name of it. It's called The Quickening. The quickening. Tell the me about it. Quickening. All right. Quickly. I shall. Um, here, here we go. This is sort of a culmination. It's something that poured out of me or had to come out of me. Um, I've been a talk show host doing this radio show in its present incarnation for about 13 years. And I have found that in every, every single human area of endeavor, socially, economically, politically, uh, the weather... Um, earth changes, um, our ecology, which is going absolutely uh, uh, crackers. In every area of human endeavor, things are moving faster exponentially. That's right. And That's right. I began to talk about it on the radio, and finally I gave it a name, and I called it the quickening. And everybody was asking me, well, what do you mean, what do you mean the quickening? Yes, yes, yes. And I've answered it a million times. Finally, I sat down, and I wrote a book, Father. Um, I'm just a talk show host. I documented what I mean by the quickening, I think, rather well in this book that's coming out. Don't call yet, folks. It's not here yet. And by the way, who's the publisher? Um, Paper Chase Press. 
Paper uh, Chase Press. Paper Chase uh, Press. I'll you, get you a copy. My, you, no, I, don't, I want to buy it because I'm an author. No, 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 no. I, I believe in buying books for people I love and know. Tell me, what's the, have you got an ISBN number for it? Um, I, I, yes. I don't want to give out... Father, I'll give it to you privately. I don't want okay. to give it out in, in any numbers okay, tonight. Fine, fine, fine. Anyway, my point for saying all this is that that poured out of me. It, it's like I had to do it. And I know. I know uh, the feeling. And so something is coming. I don't know what it is or when it will be here, but I know that we're beginning to race toward it at mm. an ever faster mm. rate. And I think that's it. Ha it's, it's, I think it might be spiritual. You're a prophet in your own right without knowing it, Art. You are, really, because uh, I have shared that view uh, long before I ever got to know you at all, uh, and I'm convinced of it from the evidence emerging from exorcisms and from what the spirits are telling us, uh, e uh, demonic, uh, de demoniacal though they may be. Well, again, it said, we shall, no man shall know the time, but, but I've got this feeling that it's coming nigh. I mean, I, I, I It is coming nigh. There's no doubt about that. Quickening. I'm going to not steal, but adopt your phrase immediately. We're in the quickening. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. So in short, what do we know about him as a writer? Without spoiling the video that I plan to do in the near future on his specific claims about the state of the church today, we can understand Father Martin as a writer who used his skills to expose the truth as he understood it with an eye towards that great awakening he saw coming. Is that great awakening coming still? Perhaps. As I've said, there is a general sense that something big is coming, and that events are unfolding towards that happening. We could see societal and political institutions losing their, their legitimacy, and people taking to the streets in ways not really seen until recently, and not only in America, but across the West as well. It is a strange time to be alive, and the state of the church makes it all the more strange. Change is coming whether we like it or not. It's time to talk about the controversy surrounding Malachi Martin. One important controversy involves Martin's role at the Second Vatican Council. The claim is made by controversial Catholic scholar E. Michael Jones, who asserted that Martin was an important part of undermining the Church's traditional teaching regarding the Jewish people. Interestingly, Martin has earlier outed the efforts of the Jesuits to undermine the, that teaching in his book, The Pilgrim, written under the pseudonym Michael Serafin in 1964, where he divulged Vatican efforts to renounce Pope John's Jewish document, which was said to have retracted the church's doctrine blaming Jews for the, Christ, for the death of Jesus Christ. I'll let E. Michael Jones explain his point himself. Uh, th this was aided by, I think, by uh, the Second Vatican Council, and in particular, the document on non-Christian religions, it's called Nostra Aetate, has come down to be known as the document on the Jews, because they're the main group that has been mentioned, and the main group figures later in subsequent history. What you had at this moment, and I go into detail in, uh, on this in the book, was uh, a, no uh, a number of Jewish organizations trying to subvert the Church's teaching, heading people, uh, the main agent, the man who was the double agent, was a, a, a Jesuit priest by the name of Malachi Martin. Malachi Martin became famous later on, writing books about exorcisms and things like that. But during the Second Vatican Council, uh, Malachi Martin was an agent of the Jews. He was working for the, for the AJC and for the ADL. He was getting money from them, you know, and he was being paid. Yes. The clue to that is that his books are all published by Simon and Schuster. Well, I think that I think that you know, to be honest with you, I think that, that he was paid for the rest of his life, and the reason he was pay, how the the way he was paid was he always had access to big New York publishing houses. Exactly. And, and it, it turns out that, it turns out that this was the uh, the way the money got laundered uh, from the uh, groups like the AJC and and the ADL. They would it would get sent to the it would end up in his publishing contracts, and he always got lucrative publishing contracts. Does that mean we can't uh, we can't trust his books because they seem to be pretty provocative and pretty revealing about the new world order? Are they trustworthy then? I, I, I was never I was never impressed with his books to be honest with you. I knew him I knew him I talked to him over the phone. He was always a you know a gracious guy, always very friendly to me. But uh, I, I just could get nowhere with his books. I mean, 
you know, he would write he would write these novels about uh, you know, the, the 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 priest who was really involved in devil worship and spent eight hours a day working in the Vatican and then at night he'd get involved in devil worship. Well I mean this this strikes me as psychologically implausible. I, I just you know, I just could never really figure out and I think I think that a lot of what you saw later on was Malachi Martin sort of repenting covertly for what he had done, because he was an agent of the New World Order. He was working for the New World Order. Despite having seen those records himself, I am skeptical. Remember that Martin's role was as the personal secretary of Cardinal Bea, which suggests he had little to no personal autonomy at the council. In addition to that work, Martin himself would later tell Bernard Jansen that Nostra Aetate was one of the problem documents and likely heretical documents promoted by the Council, along with the documents on ecumenism. Take that as you will. The claim that made Malachi Martin a household name in some quarters was his claims regarding the Third Secret of Fatima. Martin would go on to Art Bell's radio program several times in the 1990s until his death talking about the Third Secret. According to Father Martin, he was present as an assistant when Pope John XXIII was shown the Third Secret of Fatima. The Holy Father had had the Third Secret read to him by Portuguese priests, as the document was written in Portuguese. The, the subject of the Third Secret is a massive one and should be saved for a future video. Suffice to say for now, Father Martin became an almost household name among Catholics and Protestants who could recognize the signs of the times in the mid to late 1990s, by going on the Art Bell sh radio show and talking as much as he could about the third secret of Fatima. He, as he tells it, was sworn to secrecy but could reveal the third secret under two conditions. One, if someone could recite it to him verbatim, or two, if the Vatican released a false third secret of Fatima or falsified it publicly in any way. That will prove interesting when we discuss the controversy surrounding his death. Father Martin died in 1999 from a head injury sustained from a fall down a flight of stairs. This has fueled speculation that he was murdered for two reasons. One, in Windswept House, he, he makes the claim that the church is essentially in the grips of a satanic cult. If true, would anyone be truly surprised that they would murder him, given the things he claims they did? Those claims will be gone over in detail in a video that I'll do in the new year on the state of the Catholic Church according to Malachi Martin. And two, it hasn't escaped the attention of almost anyone that the Third Secret was released the very next year and was not nearly as apocalyptic sounding as Malachi Martin made it, made, made it sound, leading many mainstream Catholics to cry foul and level accusations that half the document was not released. So let's uh, cover some of the controversies. The first one is the most often cited, which is the claim that he was an adulterer and vow breaker. He is accused of having slept with the wife of Robert Kaiser, his wife Susan, while she was pregnant a claim made in the book Clerical Error, among a couple of other books. The supporting evidence used are sources like known heretics John Courtney Murray and other Jesuits. It's also well known that the Superior General of the Jesuit Order had repeatedly misrepresented the nature of Martin's leaving the priesthood. On both cases, Malachi Martin was very frequently uh, rejecting the claims made against him. But there are more rumors, including claims that he had inappropriate relations with some of his female friends and neighbors. Interesting, these claims started popping up around the time that Windswept House was published, which makes the claim that only was a black mass held in the Vatican in order to enthrone Lucifer, but also that the consequences of that enthronement would be the promotion of a purely worldly agenda that would confuse the gospel for secular social justice, population control, feminism, and environmentalism. Martin would later allude to Cardinal Bernadine, the infamous homosexualist, as being the bishop who conducted the satanic rite. Bernadine was a close confidant of former Cardinal McCarrick. This claim that Martin was an adulterer is one I'm willing to dismiss entirely based on the only evidence presented being a book written and, and supporting documents written by known heretics from an order that Martin had that at that time exposed in his own books. No other evidence has really been offered, as far as I'm aware. And it is curious that the timing of these allegations were such that they practically coincided with when Martin began to speak publicly about the claim of Luciferians in the Vatican as well as the Third Secret of Fatima, a claim he asserted was true until he died, which we'll go over in a moment. The next controversy is also an interesting one. Was Malachi Martin a set of a contest? In short, I highly doubt it, if his public statements about John Paul II were any indicator. 
He often would say that JP II was a valid pope, even if towards the end Martin became very black-pilled about John Paul II, free freely being critical of the elements of his papacy, as the following clip will illustrate. Why is it that these three popes, the last three popes, refused? And when John Paul II was asked to now consecrate Russia, no, all he could do was kneel in Tempeta Square, and in the middle of a consecration of the human race, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, he said, and also we consecrate to her care the people who are awaiting their consecration to her Immaculate Heart. What sort of gobbledygook is that? For me, that's gobbledygook, and disgusts me you know, on John Paul II's lips. He's supposedly uh, a knight uh, of the Immaculate Queen. He's supposedly a member of Maximilian Colby's uh, group of knights fighting, and he wouldn't do this. One of the assertions of his being a set of a contest comes from this photograph, which will segue us into the next controversy. Shown there are several set of a contest bishops, men who had broken from Rome after the Second Vatican Council, over perceived heresies promoted by Rome in the post-conciliar era. Martin made pretty clear in the latter years of his life, a point Michael uh, Matt at The Remnant also made recently, specifically that the enemies of the church and our enemies as traditional Catholics are not people in the SSPX, the FSSP, set of acontists, or even traditionally minded Catholics in diocesan Novus Ordo Missae parishes, nor are Catholics who earnestly and honestly seek the truth of the faith and answers in the present crisis who attend the new mass as enemies of the church. The innovators, the usurpers, the modernists are the enemy. Satan is the enemy. It's clear that Martin shared this opinion himself as his numerous interviews attest. Plus he worked with the institutional church as an exorcist and hearing confessions until his health became too much of an issue to continue that work, which set of a contest aren't known to do. But let's turn to that picture again. Another controversy is this. Was Malachi Martin secretly ordained a bishop? That answer might actually be yes. Look closely at that picture and you'll see clearly him wearing the traditional cassock of the Roman bishop. You can see the crimson there along with the black. Who, ordered, who ordained him would be a mystery. If I had to venture a guess, I'd say it might have been Archbishop Lefebvre, who was not a set of a contest at all despite people making that claim. Malachi Martin spoke positively about Lefebvre frequently. Here's one example. Well, I must tell you, the older I get, every day I bless the Lord for having given us Archbishop Lefebvre. Because no matter what defects or excesses there may be in other way in the society of Pius X, the society he founded, the institute he founded, there is this one thing. They have ensured that the church has a small but definite supply of validly ordained priests who say valid masses and hear valid confessions. And that, for me, is a boon from the hand of God. This can't be the work of Satan. Satan doesn't do that. It's cutting off his nose to spite his face. So I thank God for Master Lefebvre. And I think that in the providence of God, he was raised up out of the Vatican Council just to counteract in a very sharp and abrupt and jolting way the onward corruption of the church in a, in a central act of worship. So I think that he's a blessing. I think he was sent by God. If he wasn't ordained by Lefebvre himself, then it was likely by another bishop of the SSPX. You can find interviews online where numerous figures affiliated with, even if not members of the SSPX themselves, speak about Malachi Martin as if they knew him personally. One such example is Canon Hess, a character of a priest who is a favorite of traditionalists. Maybe someday I'll do a profile on him. But a question remains, then, if Martin was secretly ordained a bishop, did he ordain any priests himself? Who knows, but one thing may be certain. What other reason would he have been to ordain a bishop if not to ordain traditionalist priests? He often made the claim that most of the uh, ordinations out there today are invalid because the Vatican did change the ordination rites in the late 60s and early 70s. There are numerous independent traditional priests running around now with valid ordinations but clearly illicit holy orders. You don't have to work hard to find them on social media. The final controversy surrounds his death. As I've said earlier, Martin died in 1999 after falling down a flight of stairs. He was confined to a wheelchair due to strokes he had suffered. 
The statement he is alleged to have made to the paramedics was that he felt hands on him, as if he'd been pushed down the stairs. He died in the hospital without being able to make further statements. Where this gets really odd is an issue of association. Some months ago, I did a video on the murder of Father Coons. I recently learned, thanks to a subscriber, that Father Coons had been associated with Malachi Martin. Coons had been an exorcist operating in the same area as Martin and had confided in him about various related subjects. Father Coons was also involved in investigating the presence of Satan worshippers in the clergy and same-sex attracted pederast clergy in positions of power in the American church. Father Coons was found murdered with a rough slash across his carotid artery, which Martin would later exaggerate in a radio interview in May 1998 in the following way. He was found at 7 o'clock in the morning with his throat cut from ear to ear, in his own blood, face down into it, and with various acts of desecration of his body, which are normally associated with Satanist reflected death. Police reports do not make reference to ritual desecration of Father Coons' body. But the story gets stranger. Apparently, Father Coons was involved in helping Malachi Martin write a non-fiction book exposing the pederast clergy and Satanists in the church in America and in the Vatican. The draft of that book disappeared on the day of Father Martin's death, despite its existence being known to people. It has never turned up. Another famous American priest from that time, Father Hardin, was also a friend of Father Coons. He himself said of the murder, I don't know if they will ever reveal why he was murdered, but I think I can safely say he was not just murdered, he was martyred. Oh, how much I could say. That's the kind of priest we need today. Those who shed their blood for what they believe and not be afraid. Not be afraid of human beings. And least of all, being afraid of dying. Out of love for and loyalty to Jesus Christ. I'm going to quote an article from Catholic World Report extensively on this murder investigation. It's linked on the Sources blog. It was Hardin who encouraged Stephen G. Brady to found the activist group Roman Catholic Faithful in mid-1996. He advised the group as it exposed one priestly pederasty scandal after another in Illinois, Minnesota, Michigan, New York, Florida, California, and other states. Father Hardin recommended Coons and Father Martin, who both advised RCF on its investigations. When Father Coons was murdered, Hardin worried the killing was related to RCF's investigation into allegations of homosexual activity with minors and priests by Bishop Daniel L. Ryan of the Diocese of Springfield. After the murder, Hardin advised one of the priest's accusers in the Ryan investigation to clam up and stay out of sight due to concerns for the priest's safety, according to Brady. Did you catch that? Father Martin and Father Coons were both assisting in the investigation into priestly abuse in the 1990s that led to the 2002 bombshell report in the Boston Globe. Father Hardin would say that, like Malachi Martin, he and Father Coons would engage in work for the Holy See directly that was covert in nature. He often described them as secret missions. Father Coons was reported to have told friends in the weeks before his death that he was afraid for his life but never said why. A priest friend of Father Coons spoke of secret missions, again his description, that he and Coons made to Chicago to fight Satanism and priestly pederasty. Is it possible that this issue was what got those priests killed? Especially considering that they were collaborating in some degree on a book that was alleged to name names of priests and bishops engaged in the abuses. One thing is clear. If you listen to, to Martin's later interviews, you sense a weariness and a deep-seated anger and sadness at the state of the church. I'll let you consider his death on your own. In my own mind, I do think it's more than credible that Martin was murdered. We've seen several priests die under mysterious circumstances in the past 20 years, often with strange diagnoses of suicides that were all but impossible. This is the stuff of conspiracy theories, but there is a pattern that is easy to see. I'll end this on my own criticisms of Malachi Martin. First, he played fast and loose with facts, most notably in his treatment of St. Ignatius of Loyola in his book, The Jesuits, where he got elementary facts about the saint wrong. There are other examples, of course. The other area, though, is more important. On Art Bell's radio show on at least one occasion, he would share airtime with people engaged in an occult activity, and he wouldn't correct them. I distinctly recall a three-way conversation between Martin, Bell, and a self-described remote viewer. That practice has been explicitly condemned by the church as a, as a cult activity, trafficking in demons. Martin never warned him against the dangers of the supposed remote viewing, which is deeply disappointing. It is possible that Martin and Bell had an agreement to not criticize his guests for their poor spiritual choices. I suppose we'll never know. The last thought I will present is this. Martin was an outspoken critic of the Vatican's handling of the Third Secret of Fatima, and he, and he publicly spoke about the Third Secret 
and promised that if the Vatican released a falsified version of the third secret, he'd be free to reveal that secret publicly. He died in 1999, and the next year they released what they claimed was the third secret, which was ridiculed by the media as likely fake. For a great take on the third secret and why the official release was likely false, I recommend Dr. Taylor Marshall's video on the third secret of Fatima, as well as a lot of uh, material from the Fatima Center. Uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall's video is very thorough. And no, I'm not suggesting that the Vatican had Malachi Martin killed because of the third secret of Fatima. So are there any other figures you'd like to see me profile in the future in this way? Let me know in the comments below. If you like videos like this, like and share this video and subscribe, and click that notification bell below. You can support my work if you want to through, to, through Patreon and Subscribestar. Links are found in the description below along with links to my Twitter, the Sources blog, and the Return to Tradition Facebook page. Thanks for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.